Let's talk a minute about Martha and Simon. Martha and Simon were in a desperate situation. They had come under the influence of some little-known men who were the disciples of Jesus Christ, some itinerant rabbi who was walking up and down Galilee and uh, Judea and Palestine uh, preaching. And uh, <clears throat> as they came under his influence, uh, these men, they came in faith to this person, Jesus Christ, accepting him as the anciently promised Messiah that was to come to Israel. <clears throat> so God touched their hearts and they became followers of what was known as the way. It wasn't known yet as Christianity. It was just simply called the way. And after they did that, they were really excited when they did that. They realized their sins had washed away. They were trusting in the coming Messiah. And then everything went to pot. Uh, their relatives would not speak to them. Their neighbors were even more hostile than their relatives. They were put out of their synagogue. They couldn't even go worship anymore. They had a small business in town. Nobody would come and buy their wares. They needed to buy things, food and other such like. But they would go into the market to do that. As they walked by the open booths, the stalls, people would turn their back on it, wouldn't talk to them, wouldn't sell them anything. Well, you can get hungry real fast when you're treated that way. They needed to buy food. They needed other things as well, of course. But the shop owners simply wouldn't have anything to do with them. Finally, it got so bad that they had to move. Them and a lot of other Christians, the followers of the way, they had to simply pack up and move to another town. They had to get into an area in which the Gentile governments ruled and not the Jewish governments. So they wouldn't be under the oppressive influence of the political Judaism in the area of Judea, Jerusalem. So they went to sell their homes and guess what? They were offered 50 cents on the dollar. But in desperation they had to sell and they did. And they were becoming impoverished as a result of this. And then they moved, and they went to this new town, perhaps on the coast, uh, perhaps in Egypt or Syria, perhaps on the other side of the Jordan River, because uh, they dispersed in a wide variety of other areas. And uh, when they got to town, generally by law, you were forced to live in some type of Jewish section of town probably heard of that. And so they went into these Jewish sections of necessity, and they went to buy property, and guess what? Now the price was 100% above the going rate. They saw them coming, and they took them. <clears throat> they were indeed in a bad way. Their home was now smaller than ever because they couldn't afford that much. They worked very hard and long hours. And uh, if somebody had come along and said something to them like uh, we hear in modern day America, things go better with Jesus, they wouldn't have a clue what you were talking about. Because nothing had gone right with Jesus since they had come to faith in this Messiah. They were living in a desperate situation, and they were beginning to wonder, did I make the right decision? They're getting letters from home saying, come home. We miss you. Just reject this sect that you have joined, this cult or whatever it is, nonsense. Come back to Judaism. Come back to the historic faith of your family. We'll get you into a nice house. Have your job back. People will sell to you and you can sell to them. Life will be good again. And that's the type of people the 
of James sits, uh, sits down and writes at this time. He's writing to desperate people who are being persecuted for their faith in a great variety of ways, who are very unhappy. And to top it off, they're uh, finding out that New Testament Christianity, we often hear what a great thing that would be. We'd like this the New Testament church, you know, like they had in the days of the apostles. By the time you get done reading the book of James, you're going to be glad you're not in a New Testament church. <laughs> because this is one of the worst churches imaginable that James is writing to. In fact, you've always heard the stories of the church in Corinth, what a bad place this was. They make Corinth look like a little bit of heaven. That's how bad the churches are that James is writing to. And so let's begin. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing I find fascinating about the, end, uh, the uh, first verse here is that <clears throat> James identifies himself, first of all, as a servant, a slave, mind you. We don't really get that strength of that word in English, servant. But it was really somebody who was purchased and was owned, like slavery in the Old South. It was not simply servant mentality, you know, I'm a servant, you know, uh, like we get in Christianity. No, this was somebody who's owned by somebody else. And he identifies himself as somebody who had been purchased by Jesus Christ. The purchase price had been paid, and now he was the property of another. He was the property of Jesus Christ. He used a very, and then all the New Testament writers did too, a very debasing term, really. Who wants to be a slave? I mean, one of your great uh, interests, if you are a slave, is to be a free man. You see, you want to buy yourself or out of slavery or somehow or another be free. Better yet, you want to be a person who is born free and don't even have the term free man applied to you. You're simply a free man who's a citizen, born perhaps in the Roman Empire yet, giving you special privileges. This is the other side of the spectrum, the most debasing term. He is a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls him Jesus Christ Lord. That's interesting because Lord uh, to the Jews implied Yahweh or Jehovah. It implied it so much that they uh, refused to say these words, Caesar is Lord. They refused to say those three words. Now how adamant were they in not saying those three words? Well, they would rather die and say those three words. <coughs> Jesus is Lord, because they would be saying, excuse me, Caesar is Lord, because they would be saying that Caesar was God. And they could recognize Caesar as God. They would not do that. But James here is recognizing Jesus as God. The deity of Jesus Christ was never questioned. If you had seen him walk on water, Raised the dead. Raised himself from the grave. You would not question the deity of Jesus Christ. Others, liberals, shall we say, come along later and might do that. They did. He is God. He is Lord. And nobody else is Lord. As far as they're concerned. But notice what, Jesus, what James does not say here. Do you notice what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, oh, by the way, I'm the half-brother of Jesus. Now that in itself is somewhat amazing, because let's face it, if you are a relative of somebody important, somebody rich, somebody powerful, we would never hear the end of it. You would never stop reminding us, you know, of how important your relative is. You may not be important, you might be as obscure as Jen was preaching about, but yeah, but I've got an uncle. They're saying, you had remind us how important. He's governor of this state. You see? He's a multi-millionaire. And that's the, you know, that's the nature. We, we, we like to do things like that. We like to identify ourselves with successful people. 
But James felt that that would be demeaning in some way to identify himself with Jesus Christ. I have some type of inside track you don't have. He never would say that. He said, I'm a slave, just like you are. I've been bought with a price, just like you have. So what he doesn't say here, I find uh, rather fascinating. <coughs> now, remember, <coughs> James uh, was not a believer during the uh, life of Jesus Christ on this earth. First of all, let's take a look at Matthew 13 here in the notes, where people said, isn't this the carpenter's son, speaking of Jesus? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, the one we're talking about today, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get these things? at all these things. Uh, a lot of people don't seem to realize it or want to realize it, but uh, Mary and Joseph had a big family. If you count them all up, four brothers and two sisters, that's six, Jesus is seven, and sisters is plural. We don't know how many he had. But it was typical then and up until recent years for families in the world to be large. My father was one of 15 <coughs> 15. That's not uncommon. And uh, <clears throat> don't forget the uh, founders of Judaism, 12 sons of Joseph. So large families were common, and Mary was not a perpetual virgin, as was taught by some religions, which would make Joseph one of the most happy, unhappiest men in Palestine. <laughs> you see, that was not the case. They had a family. Now, she, of course, was conceived of the Holy Spirit. She was a virgin. But after that birth, of course, uh, she and Joshua came together and they had a family, a large family. And James was one of the children in that family. <clears throat> and do we not read in John, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So his brothers, plural, we know what his brother's names are. And nobody believed in Jesus in this family. And uh, <clears throat> Paul says, Don't we have the right to take a believing wife with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and uh, Cephas? Well, it tells you one thing about Cephas. Peter, he had a wife. And so which meant that he wasn't a monastic either. What a bad theology can be solved if you just read the Bible. Just saying. And so, but Peter had a wife, but the Lord's brothers is the phrase there we're focusing on. Jesus had half brothers. And James was one of those half brothers. So we got to identify. Now, Jim talked this morning, conveniently, about the several possibilities of who the various Jameses are. <coughs> Uh, in the New Testament. And uh, as far as authorship of this book is concerned, without going into you know, 100 pages of reading, which I've done, uh, to the authorship of uh, the book, the general consensus for you know, 2,000 years has been that James, the brother of Jesus, was the author of this book. Now, the <clears throat> thing about James, of course, he wasn't a believer. Before... Uh, the crucifixion. He, he simply wasn't uh, a part of that teaching ministry in a sense. But we know he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, as Jim mentioned this morning. Appreciate him adding to my message like that. He became the leader of the church. And we read in 1 Corinthians, then he, Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Notice how interesting that is. We not, can't be entirely sure if he's talking about order of appearance, but it almost gives the appearance here as you read it that the first person perhaps after the women at the tomb that he appeared to was James. And then he appeared to the apostles. You see how the focus that was? That's fascinating uh, if that's what's being said here. <coughs> Jesus had a plan for James, his brother. Half brother. And 
Judas, who also wrote the book by that name in the Bible. That's another half-brother. And in Acts 12, speaking speak of here of Peter, but monitoring to them with his hand to be silent. Remember, he just broke out of jail. He described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Why James? James was the leader. He was the senior pastor in Jerusalem. Now that's rather fascinating. you got 12 apostles, and the senior pastor is not one of them. You see, it's James who's running the show. And, of course, the, see, the apostles, who you might say, were you know, itinerant missionaries. They weren't always going to be in Jerusalem, and James wasn't leaving Jerusalem. That would make sense. But uh, Jesus had called James to a special ministry, clearly. <clears throat> and then after the famed council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, and when uh, the others had finished speaking, uh, James replied, not Peter, not John, not all the big shots, so to speak. James replied, brothers, listen to me, and gave his opinion how they should deal with this issue. He was truly a leader of the church. And then <clears throat> when Paul got saved, he came to Jerusalem. Nobody would have anything to do, and they were afraid of him because he had been persecuting the church. Barnabas took him in. Uh, and then also it says, and on the following day Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. They don't, they don't mention anybody by name, just all the elders or all the apostles, but by name is James, because he's the guy in charge. <clears throat> and then Paul mentions later in Galatians, James, Cepheus, which is of course Peter and John, those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas to write him a fellowship. Pillars, the most important men in the church in Jerusalem. Well, we expected uh, Peter, John. What throws you here, if you don't know the Bible, of course, is James is in that, in that picture. One of the three pillars of the church. <clears throat> and then, of course, it says a certain uh, men came from James. Uh, and, of course, they, the idea of whether this was true, we don't know if they did come from James and stir up trouble, probably not. But the, you know how people like to throw names around. They get authority by the use of a name. Well, I've been talking to the pastor, and he said, you see what I'm trying to say? I got, you know, pastor may know nothing about this, but, you know, how you can throw a name in there and get a little punch to your argument. Well, they, well we just came from Jerusalem, and uh, James said, well, we're not sure James said anything there. Uh, <clears throat> so when it's all said and done, there are several Jameses in the New Testament, and the consensus of the church is that this James, <coughs> the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and the leader of the church of Jerusalem, is the author of this book. Now this book, in terms of its date, is fascinating in one sense, because <coughs> it is the first New Testament book you ever wonder what the first one was? This is it. Up until this point, the scriptures were entirely the Old Testament. And this was the first time under the providence of God that the church of Jesus Christ gets extra revelation, additional revelation, which in time will make up our New Testament. But this was the first book that goes into that collection. <clears throat> James wrote of necessity, if it's the first book, rather early. Uh, you'll notice my notes here said it was written around uh, 44, 45 uh, A.D., for, uh, or actually 47, 49 uh, A.D., somewhere in that. We don't know when. We know <coughs> that the uh, Council in Jerusalem was held about 49, and uh, we know that uh, James doesn't mention anything about that council. We also know that James died about 62 A.D., so it had to be much earlier than that. And uh, that's about when it was written. This is only about uh, 17 
18, 19 years after the resurrection, from around the day. <coughs> the audience of this book, this is book is written to uh, the 12 tribes of the dispersion. <coughs> Uh, part of verse 1, where he says to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. Now the dispersion, or dysphoria, the Greek word, is, uh, refers to the scattering. That's another translation of that word, scattering. The 12 tribes of the scattering. Judaism had been scattered when the Assyrians captured the ten northern tribes and the Babylonian captured Judah. That began the scattering of Jews around uh, the Mediterranean world. <clears throat> However, this uh, scattering continues in the New Testament time as well under the persecutions that occur in Jerusalem. So. <clears throat> This book was written, the audience of this book is uh, Jews. They were poor and oppressed people, as we mentioned. They had a lot of behavioral issues, serious ones we're going to study. Uh, study. Uh, so uh, let's move on. By reading Acts 2, 8 through 11, we read this. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language. This is Peter talking on Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygera, Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Who are all these people? They are visitors to Jerusalem who've come for the holy feast. They're Jews of the scattering. These are people who had been scattered in perhaps uh, you know, hundreds of years earlier and been scattered amongst the, uh, uh, the empires of the Near East, but they keep their religion and they keep coming back for the Jewish holidays. <clears throat> we also read in Acts 8, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So now we have New Testament scatterings. Jews are continuing to be scattered. Now, we just read about Pentecost, and these people that came to Pentecost, many were saved, took the gospel back with them to these cities. Paul, which is on the forefront of uh, evangelism and missionary activity in the Mediterranean world, when he's in Corinth, uh, Corinth, he's writing to the Roman church, and he's never been there, and neither has anybody else. But there's a church there. And this, you know, Pentecost right here, shows you the origin of that church. These people heard the gospel and took it home with them. Now, Paul knows he ministers, uh, of course, to uh, these people. He knows they need some theology. They got a lot of good things going. They need some more good things going. And so he sends them the book because he's heard word. And they're just uh, you know, a little bit confused about some theological issues. A lot of people are until they read the book of Romans. And then that settles a lot of bad theology. It's a great book. It's the most theological book in the New Testament. We also read about Paul himself in Acts 8 where it says that Paul was ravaging the church, the great leader of the church, was at one time a great hater of the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went preaching the word. That's our word, dysphoria, scattered. So the thing to remember here is there is indeed a great scattering, and James is writing to the people who have scattered. Some of this was... Uh, as a result of ancient scattering, some of it was uh, more uh, uh, recent persecution, some of it was economic. You just couldn't live. And history, church history tells us there were villages in Palestine that were made up of almost virtually 100% Christians. Because they had to come together to live. They couldn't live anywhere. Nobody would, they were dying, virtually, or literally, because they couldn't buy and sell. 
They had to live in communities where economic activity took place. So there were voluntary scatterings, too, just to find a place to live. And that's uh, part of the, the audience here. <clears throat> now we come to one of the uh, fascinating uh, verses in uh, this book. And it is verse 2. And it's one I've struggled with. And if you haven't struggled with it, I'd be surprised. You probably have. He says this simple thing. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Uh-huh. Is that what you do when you meet trials of various kinds? You count it all joy. Oh, praise God, I'm being persecuted. You know? Lost my job today. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, most people don't do things like that. They don't count it all joy when horrible things happen to them. And I want to suggest, and that's why I've, I, I've spent a lot of time in recent months. I knew I was going to teach this class several months ago, and I've been working on it. And I've just spent a lot of time thinking about this verse and researching it and asking myself, who does this? <laughs> you know, you know, I don't find myself in a class of people like that who does things like that. And then I sat back thought about it and said, you know, I'm not sure you have to, you wouldn't be nuts. If you did things like that, if you were being persecuted and starving to death and being beat and run out of town and, and on and on and on and your life was miserable and you're counting it all joy, I think that's somewhere in some mental health dictionary, that's the <laughs> definition of insanity, you know? People don't do that. And uh, now God expects us you know, bring our brain to the study of the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean we rationalize away what the Scripture truly tells us. But we do have to think it through carefully and make sure we understand what's being said. And so as I began to study this uh, all <coughs> question, I learned something. The teacher always learns more than the students. I learned something about uh, words like this, the Greek word pasta. Uh, all joy. The word, and a lot of similar words, adjectives in particular, can have what they call quantitative meanings and translations and qualitative meanings and translations. And when I read that in one of the commentaries, I thought, aha, I'm onto something. Because it became instantly clear to me before I finished the paragraph of what the commentator was saying that James wasn't saying that the only emotion you should have is, you know, all, is joy in a crisis. And my best guess is, best guess is that nobody in this room or in this church, that's been their only emotion in a crisis. You see? But he qualitatively, I think if we translate it that way and understand it that way, would be saying something like this, count it a true joy a real joy, a genuine joy. Now you may have other emotions. You may have fear. That's a pretty good one at times of crisis, persecution. You, you may have anxiety. You may have uh, all sorts of worry and, and uh, where your next meal is coming from and everything else. But in the midst of the mass, uh, the flood of emotions that may overcome your soul, have a genuine and a real joy in reference to this issue, this problem, this persecution. That makes sense to me. And I think that's exactly what James is saying. And I even found uh, one translation uh, that made that point. I didn't actually write it down, but it made that point. I recently, maybe you're familiar with this Bible translation. I was not. came across a Bible translation, Holcomb by... Uh, was it a uh, reference Bible? I'm not sure if the uh, name Holcomb is the one I remember. Anybody have that Bible? I, I'm not sure, but I think that might jar my memory as a, a, a word, Holcomb, it used in the Southern Baptist Convention. Is that anybody ever hear that word before? Uh, Holcomb uh, hymn book or anything like that? Uh, anyway, wherever it 
came from. <coughs> I find that's an interesting translation. I have some Bible software, and that translation was a uh, uh, Bible is part of it, and I stumbled across that, read it, and every time I get to a hard verse, I look it up and say, boy, that's a good translation. So it might be a, a second translation if you want to uh, get a second Bible, Oakham Study Bible or something to that effect. Um, <clears throat> because it makes the point that I'm making here, and kind of some commentators have made, that what James is saying is, look upon this and have a genuine joy that God is in your life and is working in this crisis and, um, to, and to trust God. Now, <clears throat> I want to make sure that you feel at liberty in the class to comment, ask questions, even take it, uh, exception, because you have a right to be wrong. And uh, <laughs> if, you, if you want to take an exception to anything, you go right ahead. But it makes it more interesting if, indeed, you do uh, comment on it. So genuine joy is the way I would tra translate that if I were translating it today. Count it a genuine joy or a real joy, my brothers, when you meet trials. I might uh, mention something else while I'm at it. And you may do this, but you, can you see the pages of this Bible? I am a great advocate of taking pen and ruler and notes and marking a Bible up. But some people, they have, I don't know, religious scruples, but I don't know where they get them. Uh, but uh, it makes, I think, uh, my Bible study more profitable. So, if at this point, this is the point I'm making here, if you want to circle the word all and write in the margin real or genuine, six months or six years when you come back to, oh, I remember him saying that, now it makes sense. If, if you see what I'm trying to say, it'll be useful, I think, to you to remember that. Uh, <clears throat> questions? Well, Ralph, I think if, if we put a period at the end of that first phrase, end of verse 2, it would be one thing, but it doesn't stop that. And I think that the, then the clarifying point becomes in verse 3 as to why you can count it joy is because there is a reward that comes as a result of your having done that. Right. It doesn't diminish the fact that there are, I think in a crisis there's going to be a multitude of emotions overflowing your life. Uh, but joy ought to be one of them, you say as you recognize that truly God is working in this crisis. If God doesn't work in crisis, God help us all. Mm -hmm. saying. But the, the point is, God does work in the crisis to do something for his glory and our benefit. And he's going to tell us about this. He says, <clears throat> he talks about trials. And tr this word trials is used again in, uh, a little bit later in this chapter. And it's also translated uh, temptations. That's a little bit annoying, I think, uh, in a sense, to me as an English reader, to realize that a Greek word can have a multitude of English translations. That's frustrating. You know? I was amazed when I found out that the word uh, faith and the word belief are one Greek word. I thought, what? I was making a big theological distinction of the two. <laughs> you know? No, they're one Greek word. So as you read, the, and the translator, you know, he randomly, I, it almost seems to me, picks his choice of whether he's going to translate this word. It's pronounced in Greek, he's going to translate it, you know, to have faith or to believe, meaning one and the same thing. Uh, and so the English reader has to know that. <coughs> and this is another one of those. This word here, uh, uh, parasmas, which is translated trials. It's also translated temptations and testing. It's a tip. And it, it helps to have some notes, perhaps. And sometimes you will have cross-references. I'm a great big believer, and it becomes so more so in recent years, of carefully studying the cross-references in a study Bible. It's amazing that uh, two things, or maybe three things, that will open up your understanding of Scripture. One, by a good study Bible. Nothing is better than the Reformation Study Bible, R.C. Sproul, editor. 
That is superior to everything on the market. Mine's not out yet. So. <laughs> That's the best study Bible you can buy. I do believe. Second thing, you know, reading those notes, those are good notes. Uh, the study Bibles, in fact, have got to the point over there, they started with the Geneva Study Bible 500 years ago, putting notes in Bibles. And they've continued, they got to the point now that this is almost a college education. If you read these notes, they're so good, there's so many of them. And if you, you know, learn what they have to say. Second thing, the cross-references have improved over the years. Every time there's a Bible of any kind that comes down, it's generally going to have cross-references. And they've weeded them in and weeded them out over the years to the point that they're really applicable. And you want to pay careful attention. And when you do, you know, look up a cross-reference and you can't make any sense out of it, that's, that's real reason right there to stop. Because you can't make out any sense out of it. And 500 years of Christianity has made sense out of it. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay, I'm missing something. You know, 500 years of Christianity says there's some meaning here to this cross-reference. I don't see it. So sit there a bit and work on that because apparently it is significant. And these uh, cross-references will open your understanding to Scripture. And here's a, the, my third point in Bible study. And this one might surprise you, might not. It's amazing how much benefit if you can, you'll get if you'll just think about it. The Bible calls it meditate. Meditate in the Bible is think. Meditate in the Bible is not study your navel. You know, that has, that's an entirely different form of meditation, unknown to Scripture. You know, so that's a different religion. In the Bible, when it talks about meditation, it's talking about thinking. Uh, just think about what you're reading. Think about the cross-references. Think about... Uh, the notes, and in fact, just walk around for days thinking about it. You just let it ruminate, just like a cow. <laughs> just let it ruminate, and one, and you'll be at work on. I got it. You see, thinking about things is uh, uh, an old, and I think it comes to the point now in, in, in America. A, a, a new virtue, as uh, people have often appear to me, lost the capacity to think carefully. Spend time thinking about the Word of God, the cross references, and the notes. It'll open up to you if you'll uh, do it. I've been studying now the book of James for several months. Nobody thinks needs to study one book for several months, but it opens up to you if you'll do that. You know, keep reading it, keep thinking about it, keep studying it, keep using the cross-reference of the Bible uh, notes or maybe even commentaries, it will open up to you. And you'll understand it in a way you've never understood it before. Now, <clears throat> he talks about meat, uh, these trials. Meat means fall in two. And I, don't, and I think it's a better translation. Some of the translations, maybe even the King James, talks about uh, fall into divers, another King James word, which means various. Uh, seems like that's the way uh, trials come. We just fall into them. If we're not expecting them, and we don't greet them with a handshake, you know, we're going to meet them, you know. We fall on our face, and we say, now how did I get in this hole? And, uh, <clears throat> Now, there are various kinds. He uses the word variance here. Peter, by the way, as you can see right here, it says, In this you rejoice, so now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Interesting. Because <coughs> there are three books in the New Testament written to this one audience, the dispersion, the dysphoria. First James, and then Peter and Hebrews were written to the same crowd. Now, they have a little bit different focus, especially Hebrews. If you read Hebrews, that's all Judaism, the whole book. He's writing to Jews. And But you write, read Peter, he'll start off said, to the 12 tribes of, this, of the dispersion. He, he's saying the same entrance, you see. And so, as you read James, you say, I want to understand James more. 
read Peter. And read, of course, Hebrews. But the most important source of reading to understand James, read Jesus. James is writing a commentary on the teachings of Jesus. You said, I'd like to read, buy a good commentary on the teachings of Jesus. It's there. It's called the book of James. I envision James <coughs> as leaving, li living a very annoying life. How would you like to be raised in a home in which all you ever hear is, why can't you be like Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word, would that drive you nuts or what? You know? Now, if one person, I think, James come to conclude he didn't like it was Jesus. And, but he couldn't get this guy out of his mind. And I get the feeling, as I read James, that, you know, the apostles and other crowds were gathered around listening to Jesus. And then there was James on the outer skirts of the crowd listening, watching, listening. This Jesus character he grew up with it was just amazing to him. He couldn't get him out of his mind. All his life, now the reason I say that is because as you read the James, you'll see him quote Jesus time after time after time after time after time. He knew it. He knew it. You ever know somebody, I've, I've, I've known preachers, you ever know somebody been saved, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years? Memorized the Bible, got that, I mean, not going to say, uh, study the Bible, maybe been Bible college, been a preacher, and then get saved? Yep. yep. That, that was James. He was saying, he had done that. <coughs> he had been to Bible college. He had set up the feet of Jesus all his life. And he didn't believe. And when Jesus rose from the grave and stood before him, the nails in his hand, like Thomas, and the spear in his side, alive from the dead, he, he believed. For the first time, he believed. He said, it all makes sense. <laughs> you know? And that's the way a lot of people, that, that's when it made sense. He conquered the death. Oh, my word, now I understand. I, do you ever wonder if he believed Mary? <laughs> I've thought about that. My basic conviction is he didn't believe a word she said. He loved his mother, but this virgin birth thing, you know, well, they were in love. You know what I'm trying to say? He didn't believe that. But at the resurrection, now he knew he was conceived of a virgin of the Holy Spirit. It all made sense to him. He is God in the flesh. And that's what he calls him. And he calls him Lord. Right here. This is why I consider James as I got to study. Yeah, fascinating book. Here, James is a fascinating man when you think of what he went through. You see, in his life. And so, he's writing to this church, this Jewish church. No Christians, uh, no uh, Gentiles in this church yet. Uh, or not, not, no, no significant amount. And not to the churches he's writing to. They're virtually entirely, or absolutely entirely, um, Jews. Now he says fall into various kinds. I'm glad he said that in some sense. But because I'm glad he didn't say when you are beat, or when you are denied the necessities of life, or when you can't find a place to live, or when... You know, you're thrown out of your home. I'm glad he wasn't that specific. Because you know what? None of those things have happened to me. They may, the way things are going. But none of those things have happened to me like they did to this guy in Laos. So by the way, if you don't subscribe to Voice of the Martyrs, you ought to. Amen. You ought to buy, uh, subscribe to that magazine and read it every month. It will be hard to read. And you will read it with tears in your eyes. And you do read it, and it's worth reading, and it's worth crying over, and it's worth praying over the people you read in that magazine. I recommend it. <clears throat> but the reason I'm glad he didn't get specific is because at this point, I haven't experienced those things, but you know what? As far as the pettiness of my mind is concerned, <coughs> I have a lot of trials and tribulations too. Now, I grant you they might be petty, but they're very real to me. And I bet they're very real to you. And sometimes they're not petty at all. They're, 
And some of mine have not been petty at all. Petty. I mean, have you ever lost a loved one? A mom or a dad or a child or a grandchild? Have you ever experienced a divorce? You realize the pain that these people go through? You know, have you ever lost a job and, and couldn't feed your family? You know, how horrible that is to have to go hand in glove. That is not right. You have to go to the church, whatever metaphor you want to use, and say, preacher, I'm broke. I can't feed my family. And uh, that's what the church is here for, by the way, when you have that issue in your life. <clears throat> These are very real and devastating to us, even though we're not being beat with whips and, and thrown into prison. We still have very real problems. There are worse out there, and I don't want to any, you know, have anything to do with any of them, but nevertheless, they could come our way. But the ones I'm facing and you're facing are still real, and I'm glad that he left the door open to various <coughs> kinds of trials and temptations and problems. You're not fit in that category. Because sick, sickness, loneliness, bereavement, disappointment, unfulfilled expectation, that's become one of my favorites. You say, well, that just sounds nothing to that. You know, I think about 90% of the drug abuse, alcohol, illegal drugs, illegal drugs, is driven by unfulfilled expectations. I have so many, you know, I, I deserve better. I can't believe this sorry husband of mine. I can't believe this sorry wife of mine. I can't believe this boss. This, you know, everything going wrong in my life, and it's not my fault, you see. And people are driven the unfulfilled expectation that just are grieved. Why isn't life better for me? You know, it just they deeply grieved. And very rarely do we sit down and give ourselves a, a talk, or maybe not even a believer, and recognize and say, where did it all go wrong? All I remember, it was when I was in the loins of Adam, See where I'm going, taking responsibility? And I sinned against God, and then everything went to pot, and then I began to reap what I had sowed, and that's how I got here. Most of the time we say, hey, we're arrogant. I didn't. If I had been in the garden, I wouldn't have done that. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> yes, you would have. And worse, probably. You say, in other words, we're in a mess, and we created it. And God in his mercy is providing solution. He didn't have to. If he just passed us all by and we all went to hell, what would he have done wrong? You know he did that one to the fallen angels? None of them were saved. He just walked away from them. They were thinking that. They had no obligation for God to save them or us. He just did that. He's merciful. Okay. God. We fall into various trials and temptations. <clears throat> and we are to rejoice because he fell in them with us. He fell in the same pit with us. And he's there with us as we go through it. And he takes that trial and temptation and that sin and everything in his own body. You know, it would just be incomprehensibly bad. I hope that's a word. Uh, to think that we could, would have to go through these things that Jesus wasn't going through with us. Right there. He does. These people were going through some bad things in their life. And they were questioning this decision to become follower of the way. Remember I told you Hebrews wrote to the same crowd. Notice what he says. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, we have no idea who. 
The author of Hebrews says in chapter 2 of Hebrews, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. That's what they were facing, drifting away from their faith. And this same crowd is being preached to by another preacher. Don't drift away. You've made a good decision. Doesn't seem like good right now, but it was a very good decision. What does this uh, Hebrews say, chapter 10? But my righteous one shall live by faith. A great verse quoted from Habakkuk. You are the righteous one under discussion here. You shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. God's called us. Don't shrink back. And that, I mean, we, we did, have we not even done that? You heard the, uh, this uh, uh, thing called backsliding? Mm -hmm. Have we not even done that? Sadly. But the Bible calls us, don't shrink back. James <coughs> is writing to this crowd who is on the verge of doing this. We know that because Hebrews is writing to the same people years later. They're still on the verge of doing it. In some sense, at least some of them are. And we're being warned, notwithstanding the trials, don't do it. For you know that the testing, the word testing means refining. You know how you take gold or silver, it's got dross in it, and you put it over a flame, and, and uh, you melt it, and then the dross rises to surface, you skim it off, and what's left is the real genuine article. You're familiar with the process? Come on, you have the Discovery Channel, right? <laughs> You see that on TV, right? How that works? Okay. That's the word. Right here. Is that my notice to quit or what? Or is, that, is that my fault or somebody else's? <laughs> uh, for you know that the testing or the refining of your faith, that's what God is doing. He's refining it. He's getting rid of the dross. Now, I don't mind at all when he does that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when he does it to me, it's a problem. You know? But that's what he does. He refines our faith. And you do that, he puts us over the flame sometimes in order to pull that off. Uh, for, uh, of your faith produces steadfastness. I'm not entirely comfortable with that word. I'm not sure if it's a modern word. You know how the Bibles over the years begin to use different words. There's old words. You know, don't work anymore. Like King James Bible, right? Anyways, but anybody here know what a Bessemer is? That's in the King James Bible. Bessemer? It's a broom. <laughs> <laughs> so modern day translation, but they broom. <laughs> we have to update the vocabulary. It's steadfast. We got an idea what steadfast is, I guess. But uh, what it really uh, means is to endure. That's more communicative to me, to endure. The pitcher, by the way, words sometimes have pitchers. The Greek word has a pitcher. It's a, a person carrying a heavy weight. That's what the pitcher is. Mm -hmm. to, to endure, to hold up under the load. You know, like Atlas carrying the world on his back? That is the word that is being used here. Because the testing, the refining of your faith produces this endurance. You ever notice the muscles on Atlas? You say, that's what we get, spiritually speaking. We get spiritual muscle. Because we endure, as God has called us to endure. Uh, it says, for you... For, no, uh, for you know that the testing. Uh, <clears throat> the word know, of course, I'm throwing out here too, is important, somewhat important, I believe. We live in an emotionally hysterical age. Every time you turn around, somebody's telling you to, you know, just let go and feel. You know, every movie or something, you know. What's inside the little butterfly? It's all of the feeling. You know, there's nothing in Scripture like that. The Bible constantly is calling us to know. 
to grow in knowledge, to put your brain in gear. Now, you say, oh, what, you're saying emotions are bad? No, of course they're not bad. But your thinking produces your emotions. And if you uh, have uh, bad emotions, uh, bad thinking, you're going to have bad emotions. Have you heard that uh, uh, computer phrase? It's called the initials of GECO. You know what it stands for? Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out emotionally. You're going to be a hysterical wreck because you're thinking wrong. If you see what I'm trying to say. You've got to embrace, you've got to know some things about God and His Word. Knowing those things are going to change the way you emote and how you um, deal with life. I think America is in a, just almost in an emotionally hysterical state. And it's one of the reasons, again, we take so many pills, I think. Emotionally hysterical state. But when you get your thinking right, you will often find that you can address these things because you're, you can bring all joy or a true joy or a genuine joy. You can only do that if you're thinking correctly, you see. <coughs> it's not the only emotion, but at least you bring the emotion of joy to a bad situation. And that helps. You see, a lot of people never bring joy to a bad situation. Maybe a lot of us, but God's called us to do that. <coughs> uh, interesting passage here, and again, the Hebrews. Remember, right? To the same crowd. For you had compassion on those in prison prison being one of the issues under discussion here. And you joyfully accept it, joy being one of the issues under discussion here, the plundering of your property, economic deprivation being one of the issues under discussion here in James. Right? <coughs> if you ever read that, say, whoa, wait a minute, the plundering of your property. Let's stop and think about that one. You're going to... Uh, Joyfully, except somebody comes along, takes your car, takes your house, takes everything you got, your money, and everything. Yay! <laughs> well, it may be not the only emotion you would have at a time like that. But joy, clearly, is taught in Scripture, is one of the emotions. I'm giving it up if people are taking it for Christ's sake. I'm giving it up. I'd rather have Christ and all the riches of eternity than that beautiful house. I love my house. Beautiful house. Don't want to give it up. But you may have to in the years ahead. Uh, and like the great heroes of chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, you may live in very difficult circumstances. <clears throat> and you may need to save me a place under that bridge you're living. <laughs> Where you may all be huddled under there. Having our property plundered by evil men. Since you knew that you yourself had a better possession and an abiding one. You knew something. Because you had knowledge, the right kind, you had emotion, the right kind. See the relationship? <coughs> Testing. Okay? Secret meaning to the word test. It means to test. <laughs> that wasn't hard at all, wasn't it? <clears throat> uh, there are two uh, verses here. One in Peter. So that the tested genuineness, or refining, same Greek word, of your faith, more precious than gold. And then Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern. This is the word here. Testing. You may discern the will of God. What is good, acceptable, and perfect. God, <coughs> of course, that's God. And I'm like Job. I'm not going to get at the front of that line and volunteer. You know, Anybody doing testing today? Me first, me first. You know, I don't think so. I'm going to the end of that line. You know, I don't want to be tested. 
But God doesn't ask you and I. He brings tests in our life uh, for his own purpose, and we have to respond properly. Of your faith, the testing of your faith. That's what it's all about. That's why they're here. It's the faith that's under test, the trials. And that's why we read again Hebrews, but my righteous one shall live by faith. That is an important verse. It appears several times in the New Testament. You may sometimes get, I know I have, to the point you don't have a lot left to hold on to. This is a good one to hold on to. The just shall live by faith. Because I don't want to be faithful, and I want to have faith if I'm weak, and I'm failing, and I'm crumbling under the test, and to be reminded the just shall live by faith. If you have to say it to yourself a hundred times in a given day, or more, I'm just, I've been saved. And I will call to God to live by faith. That God loves me and will work in this trial to my benefit and his glory. Right. I think the thing you said there is so important for us to remember, which is that that word faith in our English language is often misunderstood because it has been appropriated in such a way that it becomes a leap in the dark. And we're not talking about that kind of faith. That's the type of faith that Kierkegaard proposed, <coughs> which is totally different from the faith that the scripture teaches, which is a belief in a sovereign God who controls every event in our lives. And that's knowledge and that's belief, rather than faith that's nebulous and kind of oily and I can't get a hold of it. Well, this is a good time of year to make that point. Because this is nearly Christmas, Christmas time. And we get these sappy movies which talk about, of course, having faith in faith. You know what I'm trying to say? Faith in nothing, really. I mean, it gets right down to it. Just having the faith in, yeah, having faith in faith. And you're right. Uh, in the Bible, it's all about the content, the object of that faith. It's nothing about having faith in faith. I mean, there are Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and, and all over the world who have faith. And they're all going to hell. Yeah. Oh, did I say the H word? <laughs> uh, politically incorrect. Having faith in faith is not the point. It's our faith in Jesus Christ. That's who James trusted for the salvation of his soul. This older brother that annoyed him all his life. To the point where he came to realize he conquered death. He's everything my mother said he was. He is God in the flesh. That was the object of James' faith and at ours. And that's what we're called to do. And that's tested that we believe God. Not just believe belief, but that we believe God. The just shall live by faith in the message. <clears throat> course, in Hebrews, it talks about great heroes of the faith. These all died in faith, the Bible said. And so, I trust, I will, and I trust you will. Because you will die. It's not that too far away from some of us. Isn't that right, Bill? <laughs> Bill and I. No. Not that far away. And above all things, I want to die in faith as these other heroes before me have done. Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I guess we're about out of time here, are we? The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let me just <clears throat> conclude here by uh, saying, Perfect and complete doesn't mean sinless perfection. That's not the word being discussed here. It comes across in English to the point where, you know, some English words I'd prefer the translators wouldn't use, even though in, there's a sense in which it's correct. But if we understand it in an incorrect fashion, then maybe a different word should be used. 
if you if you follow me. How about fully mature and developed? That's what I've come up with as to what James is saying, that you may be fully matured and developed in your faith. Not that you've come with, some people will take this verse and others and say, I've reached sinless perfection. You just lie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just told a lie. So. Now, we don't do that on this earth. I wish we did. It doesn't happen. But we can become mature and develop in the Christian faith, the knowledgeable of the things of God, and have real and true faith, notwithstanding the fact that we do struggle continually. Any questions before we conclude today? Lacking in nothing. <coughs> James said, he didn't want his audience to lack in anything. He's going to go on again and explain all the things they lack in. <laughs> but he didn't want them to lack in anything, or us either, for that matter. What he's saying is, is a promise here. A promise. It's an opportunity that this can occur. It's important, you know, if there, were, if there was no persecution in America ever, like there is in other parts of the world, with one martyr every five minutes, Jim said, somewhere in the world. I was reading this week in uh, <coughs> uh, the magazine, uh, or, or not, you're talking about Nigeria, when the black pastor there was talking about we were being blamed, you know, that there's problems on both sides, the Muslims and I. He said, let me explain what's going on. They're doing the killing, we're doing the dying. He said, that's what's going on on both sides. He said, the Christians, in other words, are under attack by the media because they're setting up militias to guard their churches. They're not going out and burning down mosques. They're just trying to keep from being burned down. And therefore, they're being blamed. Well, you're just as guilty as they are. This point said, let me clear the air for you. They do the killing, we do the dying. That's what's going on on both sides. To the tune of one every five minutes around the world. 